Hey, how you doing, folks? Um, yeah, today I was going to talk about anon anonymous yeah. animals that ain't supposed to be there, but they are. And I'm not talking cryptozoology. I'm talking actual animals. Uh, we actually have a, a case here in Pennsylvania that, um, I should say cases here in Pennsylvania, where they say that we do not have mild lines. Meanwhile, I actually know people that have pictures of them on their trail cam. I've seen one of them myself when I used to deliver in the area. Um, Westmoreland County. Hey, Nature Girl. In Westmoreland County, there's um, a friend of ours lived down there and I delivered into, into his area. Every night, he used to get pictures on his trail cam of mountain lions. He showed them to the DNCR and says, those aren't from around here. He goes, dude, that's my trail cam out in front of my house for playing in my driveway. <laughs> so, um, I did look at some of, um, some of the quote unquote news, looked up some, looked up some stuff. And, um, one of the first things that they said, what that had said was, in 1871, supposedly the last mountain lion was shot in Pennsylvania. And in 1930, the last mountain lion was shot east of the Mississippi and been declared extinct. I uh, don't know how well that's working out for you because... Um, Oh, it's okay, Nature Girl. It's it's all right. Thank you. Uh, because we do know that there is swamp panthers in Florida. Um, been reports of Jagarundi, which is a smaller uh, big cat in, I believe it's Alabama and Louisiana. Uh, the Blue Mountains have been seeing the sightings of, yeah, I'm good. Thank you, Nature Girl. Yeah, Eastern Mountain Lions, they're, they're supposedly extinct, but uh, yeah, no, they're not. <laughs> um, yeah, but in the Blue Mountains, they, there's been sightings of them. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, we've had sightings. I've seen them on myself. So that's one. Um, another animal that they say is extinct that they supposedly have been finding again is the thylacine. Down in, oh, where was that? Australia. Uh, the thylacine was thought to be extinct in the, like, 1901, I believe. Very, the yeah, very late 1800s. Actually, it has to be 1900s because they have one on, on um, a movie, black and white movie, uh, silent reel. Uh, the Tasmanian tiger. Well, now they're thinking that they caught a couple of these Tasmanian tigers in Australia. Hey, Tibor, on um, not webcam, um, trail cam. They're thinking that they did anyway, so they could possibly still be around. It, it's that's not unheard of. Uh, off the coast of Japan, uh, while fishing, they caught a fish that was thought to be extinct for over twenty. I said for over like twenty, either like twenty thousand or two hundred thousand years, and they did a little digging around and found that the fish is actually thriving there. It's not just like an oddity that they found like one of the last ones left that they're coming back <clears throat> oh 
Oh, that's cool. No, that's one thing we do have here in Pennsylvania. We do have bobcats. I've seen them too. And um, they're very prevalent. <coughs> um, another animal uh, in the White River in Arkansas. Um, and I think it just swam up. It just swam up there for. It wasn't really lost. Just kind of swam up there, just to swim up there, maybe trying to find a new range or whatever. Was it in the White River in the 1800s? They found a narwhal. How it ended up there, they don't know, but they found a narwhal in the White River. In the White River. Uh, Beast of Exmoor. That's another one. That's one that's supposed to be a cryptozoology in Britain. Uh, someone supposedly has a picture of it. It is a black panther. So there's all kinds of cases. I mean, if if you guys have some, let, let me know what you guys have. But um, there's all kinds of cases of these animals. Pretty much. That's what I'm thinking. Um... What I think what I think is happening either it's progress encroaches or we think they're extinct, but they're so deep that we don't see them until progress approaches and kind of flushes them back out again. Yeah, we do have a couple cases of uh, people uh, keeping them as pets because a lot of people like this uh, out of place animal saying those are pointing to the alligators at the mall. Well, they tracked them down to some guy's house with proof because <laughs> the guy goes, Well, it's kind of hard to report a um, an eight foot long alligator missing when you're not supposed to have them in the first place. <laughs> They found three uh, three alligators, and all three of them came from the same house on the Monongahela River. We found we found one um, on the Beaver River, and I think one or two in the, two um, on the Ohio River. So they're around, but they were all pets. And I think it got too big, and people just kind of well throw you in the river, go with God, hope you don't die, see you later, and leave. Like, can you imagine what it costs to feed an eight foot long alligator? Wow. <clears throat> but um, there's those alligators in the um, New York sewers. People never thought they existed. And I remember watching a show where they had a remote control camera in one of the sewer tunnels trying to figure out what was going on with it. And it got attacked by one. I mean, you could clearly see it coming coming after a remote control vehicle. Um, trying to say kangaroos in Texas too, and they did find pictures of them. And what that ended up being was um, there's a lot. Of, this is like in the 1930s, 1940s. Um, people would not they weren't up here as pets. They're even back then in Texas, there are a lot of places to hunt exotic animals. And people brought them in to hunt. Well, they kind of got loose. And I don't know how many of them are left, but there were kangaroos at one point in time in Texas. No. Not today, anyway, Tibor. Um, the ones I'm talking about are actual real animals that we know exist but they're not where they're quite supposed to be yeah that's no yeah i forgot all about them and they were using those i think to um Weren't they use them in uh, Southern California for um, desert work, crossing the desert for stuff? And they're using for something. And I think wasn't then the U.S. military have them down there.
Um, there's another one here, like Bald Eagles in Pennsylvania. Uh, people don't think there's a lot of, yeah. People don't think there's any, uh, bald, I won't say it doesn't think there's any Bald Eagles, but for the longest time, you didn't really see any until you went up north. I'm talking about like south southwestern Pennsylvania. You didn't see any until you went up around Franklin, Oil City, and kind of started your way out east in the mountains. Um, there's a couple places down here in southwestern Pennsylvania now that you can't go without tripping over one. I mean, they're everywhere now. They're like, where do these things come from? I'm like, well, they kind of migrated in. Uh, same thing with the osprey. Uh, the only place that we had osprey around here was uh, Moraine State Park. And there's a lot of places where you'll find osprey now. Uh, one that was on the... I don't know if it's still on the endangered list that you hardly ever seen around here. It was a blue heron. Uh, blue herons now you see a lot of. And if you talk to somebody from the uh, fishing game, you're like, oh, you don't see blue herons. I'm like, I see those damn things everywhere. It's kind of. Oh, yeah. And the bald... talking about that, the bald eagles have kind of moved in on Lake Erie, um, especially up around Prescott. Any of the um, parks on Lake Erie, you'll find a lot of um, bald eagles. Uh, what's that one park in Ohio that's up on Lake Erie? Lake uh, Nature Park or um, State Park. Hey, Ginger. Yeah, because someone told me they're seeing a ton of them up there. So, I mean... If you actually sit down and think about it, you can probably think about yeah, uh, agreed, Tibor. Agreed. Uh Canadian geese can be a pain in the ass. That's one I'd like to see. I wouldn't not I wouldn't say eradicated, but seriously thinned out. Oh, there you go, nature girl. That's kind of cool. Yeah, and that, that's, that's another thing. Um, and I think they rounded them all up because a few years back, I can't remember when, T-Board could probably remember, I think it was maybe 2016 this happened. Someone wants to tell me 2016. The guy from Zanesville that um, uh, released all his animals from his private zoo and shot himself. <laughs> And I mean, he had a ton of them. There's lions and tigers and monkeys. They're running all over, all over the place down there. I, I, I know it was Zanesville. I just can't remember the year. I think it was, I think it was 2016. Someone told me it's 2016. But yeah, if you look at the zoos, uh, don't have animals get loose from zoos. Sometimes they don't always get them back, and they think, well, they ain't going to survive, and they end up doing. Uh, rehab centers, um, wildlife rehab centers. Um, I can take you to a place, it's not rehab, it's called Living Treasures, and they kind of do a little bit of a rescue there. Um, and some of the stuff that they have in there that, were, that was rescues is just mind-blowing. They had a chimpanzee that somebody owned. It wasn't a zoo, it wasn't... Okay, nature girl. Hey, that's that's okay. Yeah, I, I, I hear you, Tibor. And some of the monkeys had some. Uh, the monkeys that came out of his zoo were rescues from a lab that were injected with the disease, so that, that could be a problem. Um. Uh, Living Treasures Animal Park, they had a couple mountain lions in there. Not the ones that run around wild here in Pennsylvania, even though they say that they're not doing that. Well, they had a couple in there that somebody owned that were like giant house cats. I was actually in the pen with them. A friend of mine worked up there and was in charge of taking care of them. And she goes... Just standing here with them for a little bit. I'll be right back. And they were like kind of just rubbing on me like two big house cats. Uh, it, it, that was kind of cool. Uh, they had a couple chimpanzees.
and uh, let me see, chimpanzees. They have a ton of camels, uh, llamas. I mean, what I mean, a ton of cam camels. I don't know where to get them all at, but the last time I went past her, I pass it every day. I looked over, I kind of looked, they had like six camels in there. <laughs> okay. So you can look at places like that. And I said, some people, I have to look into that one. I haven't heard about that one yet. Uncle Wow. But there's a lot of places. If you look at some of these rescues and some of the exotic animals, and those are the ones that make it into the rescue. Some of these people that have exotic animals, they'll, they'll take it out in the middle of nowhere and just leave the damn thing loose. Yeah, they, they can get like that, Nature Girl. Uh, da, 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 da. Really, Uncle Al? It, like, uh, the one thing I was saying, though, is, um, like, the mountain lion, if the mountain lion truly is coming back into Pennsylvania and they've seen him in the, in the Blue Mountains on the Blue Ridge, I would not be surprised if they migrated there because they, they said that there's, as of, like, 1930-ish, there's no, the eastern mountain lion was declared extinct, but now yet they they find them on a regular basis in the Everglades. So if they're not kind of down in the Everglades, and you have to remember, 1930, they didn't really, they didn't really explore the Everglades like it has been, like it is now. Oh, it's okay, TM Bushcrafter. I did not set this up to about 10 minutes before it started anyway. So, um, it's, I've had a hard couple of weeks here. I'm not going to lie about it. I uh, had a cousin pass away, and I was kind of on a kind of on a block with what I wanted to do with a um, live stream tonight. Uh, last week I completely called it off because of that's when I got the news. So hey, Carol. There's another one, Jaguars. And Jaguars probably came up through, uh, came up from South America through Mexico and into Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. And that's not unheard of. Animals migrate. Uh, we have coyotes in Pennsylvania. Oh, thank you, Tibor. Um, here in Pennsylvania, we have coyotes. Well, that's not too unheard of. The thing is with, with the coyotes, when they do a DNA breakdown, they, they do find – oh, I got you, Tennessee. I got you. Um, but back to what I was saying, when they do the DNA breakdown, and this is kind of the hush-hush part because they won't outright say it. They find dog. I'm not – that doesn't surprise me because – there are stray dogs running around, and coyotes can breed with dogs. That's we know that, but they also found timber wolf DNA in there. And how did timber wolf get in there? Because we do not have any wolves in Pennsylvania yet. Follow along because this could get interesting. Um. The coyotes that we have here in Pennsylvania, the record was that that's been shot has been 70 pounds. DNA tested, mostly coyote. Was a little bit of dog, a little bit of timber wolf. What I think is happening, well, first they, they actually tracked the DNA back to where the eastern or the Pennsylvania version or the northern northeastern United States version of the coyote comes from. And they tracked it back west through Ohio, right south of the Great Lakes. And then once it got 
the other side of the Great Lakes. They actually tra traced it north past the Great Lakes and east above north of the Great Lakes into that area. That is known Timberwolf territory. So they crossbred with the Timberwolves as they migrated back down around in the, into this part of Pennsylvania. Okay, Tennessee, hope to see you back. But they said that, that never happened. The PADNCR, meanwhile, other biologists said that this is what happened. <laughs> but um, with that being said, and a 70 pound coyote, really? See, that's what a lot of people think. They reintroduced the wolf. Most wolves, timber wolves anyway, the low range is probably about 65 pounds. And they'll go up to about 100. And these ones are between 50 to 75. And they have found a, mostly coyote DNA with some timber, with I think one quarter timber wolf, one quarter dog. They call, we, they call them koi wolves around here, or koi dogs, the ones do. What I think is happening is the more these coyotes proliferate and breed, because of 25% of the DNA, the timber wolf part of the DNA is becoming the dominant part of the DNA again. They're reverting back to that timber wolf. I would not be surprised. Yeah, then, yeah, then add the dog, then add the wolf on top of that. So you got two breeds in there that are larger than a, than a coyote. Now they're not getting as big as the wolf. Okay, Uncle Al. But they're definitely bigger than what the original coyote was. So, yeah, because they, they found them in Ohio, too. I've seen them. Um, I've never seen what. Here's the funny thing about a coyote, just a little personal thing. I've never seen a coyote in the wild. But when delivering in Ohio, I've seen him in Ohio a few times. One time sitting along the turnpike, one time I was hit one coming out of a cornfield. Super bear, or you mean sugar bear? Because that's an, that's another thing. Oh yeah. Um, when it comes to black bears, everybody thinks of a black bear. He's got the little brown muzzle. And that's that's what happens for a black bear. We found black bears with brown muzzles. We found black bears that they call cinnamon bear. They are like a dark brown. We found a honey bear or a sugar bear, which is oh, they're they're in town here. They they they've seen them in Pittsburgh. I just haven't seen one there myself. Um. Uh, they found a, a honey bear, what they call honey bear. It's all variants of the black bear that's kind of almost blonde. So black bear, we got like three or four different colors of black bear running around here in Pennsylvania, too. Oh, see, I can, I can hear them here, too, especially when it, when the uh, the pups are out. And they'll just start hooting and hollering all over the place. And... Um, I've heard regular coyotes, uh, a cousin of mine who lives in California, um, where there's actually regular coyotes in California. They're very high pitched. They almost sound like a fox. These ones out here sound like wolves. 
I mean, they sound like wolves. They got that little howl, and you'll hear that howl for miles. Now that is interesting, Carol. Because regular coyotes, here's the other thing. Regular coyotes are solitary animals. The strain of coyotes that we have here with the timber wolf them sounds like they came down there because they are the ones up here are pack animals. And very timber wolf like uh, tendencies. Yeah, and see, like around here, we don't see bears very often. It's like, oh, there's no bears around here. Well, I see one in my backyard, okay? Uh, very rare. We found bear scat here in the woods, but this is like a once every three to five year thing, if not more. Okay. There, they could be coyotes that also uh, crossbred with dogs, too. It all depends, Nature Girl. Um, like the Pittsburgh Zoo, uh, they have a policy that the only animals that they're going to bring into that zoo are animals that were already in captivity and know the presence of man to begin with. Uh, they don't go out hunting for them. Uh, most zoos are like that now. Most of the animals that you see in the zoo were born and bred in a zoo someplace. Josh, my dog's over here growling for no reason. But, um, yeah, there's some weird stuff out there. Um, another one that's been documented, I've seen it on the, seen it on the news. Uh, they had video of it on the news, so it's not like the news report had been ever showed. Oh, he's good. He's just kind of thinking he's guarding the place right now. Um, like up to Potomac. Uh, some in the St. Lawrence uh, and a few others, a few other um, rivers that empty into the Atlantic Ocean, they found sharks up the rivers. Oh, I hear you, Tibor. I mean, there, there's a couple places around here, not so much here on our property, but close by, it's getting like that. <clears throat> but they they I've seen videos of sharks up these rivers. Uh, people say sharks are pure, pure, purely salt water, but they're solely in a freshwater river. They're not in the brackish water. They're solely in the freshwater, and they're working their way upstream. In California, the seals do that on the delta. They see uh, seals on the delta. And they're coming out of the brackish water, going into the fresh water, going about their way. Um, a fish that they know that, that that'll do that is um, striper bass. Uh, striper bass can, can live all their lives in fresh water, can live all their lives in salt water or brackish water. And they can, if they're in an area, they can travel back and forth in between the two. So that, I wouldn't say that's an anomaly, a um, animal that's out of place. 
but that's an example of people think they're either one thing or another, and they they could have they could happen to be both. Shark is sharks were the ones that kind of caught people by surprise. It's like why is a shark going seventy miles up this river? Uh, like one animal that supposedly is extinct now, and it went extinct not that long ago, is the river white sturgeon. Or, uh, uh, yeah, I said that right. River white sturgeon, which get absolutely huge. Um, supposedly the last one was caught a couple years ago in the Allegheny River, and the guy released it. And like two or three years later, they found a dead washed up on the shore. And they have not seen another one since. Oh, there you go, Nature Girl. So that that's the one I'm kind of looking for again. I'm like, I'm thinking, thinking there has to be more there someplace. Maybe not as large as the last one that was caught, but there has to be one there. Um, supposedly, there's not that many left in Lake Erie. It's kind of like a dying fish. Um, I'm talking about fish. Another fish they said that, that weren't in Lake Erie, but I've seen videos of them all over the place. They finally had to acknowledge this. Yes, that, that, that they're there because that's what the bass are feeding on now is goby. There's goby all, all over Lake Erie. Um, another one is, um, and those are kind of brought over from Asia too, not to be released. Uh, one kind of hijacked its way on a uh, ship and ended up here was uh, snakehead fish. And so far from what I know in Pennsylvania, is um I was gonna say um blah, 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 blah. is what they what they call a catch and kill policy. Uh they're an invasive another one of these animals out of place they're just invasive species. Um we have the lantern fly here. Stink bugs are another one. Um believe it or not cubs do. Down south, kudzu is an invasive species. Um, so there's a ton of them. Um, a lot of your roadworks crews, your uh, your uh, department, state department of transportation, they would bring in uh, foreign or genetically modified. Yes. Yes, the angel. You're talking about the angel head? I mean, the uh, not the angel heads, the um, snakehead fish. But when it comes to plant life, a lot of your, a lot of different state departments of transportation would bring in some of that foreign plants and plant them along the roads to control erosion. You see how well that worked. <laughs> yeah, I did. I have heard that Japanese honey, honeysuckle. Uh, we have American bamboo here. And it's like you can't kill that stuff. Or I just say northern bamboo. Uh, you can't kill it, and it's it's not like the bamboo that grows in Japan or China or wherever. But this stuff's kind of like, they have a saying here that you can go outside in the middle of the night when it's real quiet and hear the corn grow. You can hear this stuff grow too. <laughs> Here's one thing people did find out about kudzu. Deer will browse on kudzu. If you go put down uh, past some of the places in the south and you look at the kudzu, you'll see that the kudzu only grows down so low. That's because the deer eat it off.
So there, there's some people that been, they've been finding kudzu in the middle of the woods, where it's growing off in the middle of the woods, and they'll start kind of scouting out that kudzu and start doing their buck their buck hunting over that kudzu. Yeah, we have cut it. Uh, as I said, that the bamboo that we have here is not good for anything. It's not structural. It doesn't look good. And as soon as you cut it, it literally just goes bleh. Especially when, when it, because it will quote unquote die back every year. So it just, it's just hollow tubes about this big around and one big, one big gust of wind, it, it's over. Because if we could use it to do something, well, trust me, we already would have been doing it with it. Um, one thing I might try to do with it, and um, I want to get it while it's alive to do it, too, is I may try making a homemade Tenkara rod out of it. Uh, for those of you that, that may have never heard of it, Tenkara is a, is a Japanese style of fishing where it, you don't have a reel. You just have a line tied on the very end. You ever see, see the kids with the sticks? Like maybe about maybe three to four foot long stick with a piece of fishing line and a hook on it. And they're kind of, Tenkara is about the same thing, but the pole is about 12 to 18 feet long. What's about the same amount of line on it, and they fish with that. It's not really like you don't. You're not doing this like fly fishing. You just kind of pick it up, drop it in another place, let it work its way down, pick it up. So, that that that's what I'd have to look into, Tibor. I'm thinking it might be. But with some with some of that stuff, you just don't know. So that's what I have to look into, see if Kenzie is up, is uh, ed edible. In fact, wait a minute. Why don't I just do this? I got another. I have another screen open. Okay, here's what Google popped out at me. And what I'll do is I'll share the screen here. I've done some fly fishing, very rudimentary fly fishing, but I have done that before. Um, it's okay. I, people who can do it good, it's, it's, it's it, very interesting to watch people who can do it good because they can sit there and do what they need to do and put that fly wherever they want it. Boom. Me, I was kind of just doing the roll cast. I get it out, get it out to four before right before it would reach the end of my line. I pull out a little bit more line, roll cast, and let it kind of feed itself out. So um Never was good at it. I kind of did the dabbling thing, but that's that's a whole other. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to share screen here. And I'll show you what I found on the kudzu. Okay, let me go back to this here. I'm going to make this full screen for you, too. So, read this, and I'm going to jump back in. Regardless of a willingness to try, is eating kudzu even possible? Yes. Say, say experts, as long as you know what you're doing. Kudzu, kudzu seeds and seed pods aren't edible, but the leaves, roots, fl flowers, and vine tips are, said Ralph 
Saperstein, senior horticulturist at the Atlanta Bot Botanical Garden. So, that is that. And we're looking at my Facebook. <laughs> nice car. We'll remove that. Yeah, no, I have a hard enough time with a uh, spin cast reel with time, so. That is what it is. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Of not too much other fish, because people try to say that drum and gar up here are, shouldn't, shouldn't be here, that you won't, you shouldn't be seeing them here, but yet we do in decent numbers, too. Oh, you're welcome, Nature Girl. And that's actually once I kind of get back in the swing of fishing here, and um, I'm going to be all oh, to let you guys know next Wednesday I might not be on because I'm going to be on vacation. Uh, we're I'm still kind of playing that by ear, but there's a good poss possibility that I'm going to be on vacation. So Friday is probably going to be. For this week, anyway, it's probably going to be my last live, live stream this week. Next week, I'm not sure when we're going up and when we're coming back. So, that I couldn't answer, Nature Girl. Um, talking about spraying stuff, but we do know that Roundup does not work on the American bamboo, I mean, the northern bamboo that we have. We've tried Roundup. We tried some other things. We tried some stuff my dad got from a um, a nursery. Some serious stuff. Uh, the other thing that we haven't tried to use to kill it is napalm and Asian orange. Even though we did try to burn it one time, not with napalm, and it grew back even stronger. <laughs> it seems like the harder you try to kill the stuff, the, the better it comes back. In fact, <laughs> But um, the other thing we found out that kills them, we, we, we were throwing old pumpkins down into there, and we have volunteer pumpkins that grow in there. Where the pumpkins come up and where the root system's at, it kills back kills back the bamboo. So maybe if we throw enough pumpkins down there, we can kill off the bamboo and get pumpkin, pumpkins to boot. I'd rather have pumpkins in that damn bamboo anyway. <laughs> Do something with that. Um, bu -bu 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 -bu. Yeah, so back to the animals part of it. I mean, if you if you think about your own state, you can probably think about animals. And I'm just talking about the United States. I'm not even talking about the world. But you can probably find animals that aren't are being found in places but are not really supposed to be being found at. Um, and one of the things I was going to say that kind of brings that about is the encroachment of man. Um, as the population grows, um, we're going to push them out. I mean, it's a sad fact of life, but it's going to happen. Um... Like back when the thylacine uh, went extinct, and I have to look back at the numbers, but I don't I think we're maybe just Tibor. We've tried that. We've been, they're still doing that, and it's still growing like like hotcakes. We actually stopped doing that. It seemed to slow down. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> but um, back to what I said, like, but thylacine is a good, good uh, case in point. Late, very late 1800s, very early 1900s, I think. In fact, someone told me like 1901. In 1901, I think we had just surpassed the one billion mark 
for population on the planet. Keep this number in mind because right now we're at a decent clip getting ready to eclipse 8 billion people on the planet. Um, no, it's, it's not an underground spring, but there is a creek running nearby, Little Feeder Creek. So it's probably pulling its water off of there. But um, early 19, like 1901, just around right. 1 billion people to, we're pretty close to rounding 8 billion people. That's a set, that's a lot of people. They have to go somewhere. And the more people you have on the planet, the more of a chance that you're going to push one of these things out that are, were either thought extinct or not even thought to be there, but they are. And the animal population is doing the same thing. Uh, the animal population is growing. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Love the bamboo. <laughs> um, but many, a lot of the animal population is expanding as well. Um, and as they expand, their territories are going to expand. So there's going to be kind of people pushing in at them and them pushing out at us. So there's, there's going to be some things seen that, look, I'm not supposed to be seeing that, but yet I am. Um, there's also new species being found. Every time they, they kind of find a cave system and they go and they kind of start looking at the creatures in the cave system, they always find something new, something interesting. Um, And it's a lot of it is versions of animals that we have here topside. But down there, they've developed, they're almost completely blind. They're either clear or white because there's no sun. They can't see, so pigments are pretty much irrelevant or they become bioluminescent. Well, bioluminescent is they glow in the dark. Or they, they can produce their own light through biological means, uh, like the firefly. So there's, there's all of that, too, that's going to come probably come into play. And uh, as I said, with human encroachment, that's just one, my take on why we're seeing some, some of this stuff happen. Um... In 1871, Westmoreland County, where they see these mountain lion at, was pretty much still wild at that point in time. There, was, there wasn't that many people down there. I mean, maybe homestead here or homestead there, but it wasn't um, a lot of those towns until the steel mills took off. And this is 1871 is before major steel. Uh, the major steel was still being made in, just in Pittsburgh at the time. So that was kind of just wild area, and without that many people living down there and room to move, the mountain lions would stay away from the people. The people didn't know they were there, so they're kind of just, just by proxy, staying away from mountain lions. They, they never crossed paths. This is kind of my take on it anyway. So, I mean, um, with the invasive species, we have the land room, we're having the land room fly come into Pennsylvania now, too. Um, it's been a while, and I'm not going to dig it up. No, it's been a while since I looked at the invasive species list. In fact, I want to do that after we're done here anyway, because I want to see if the one lake I'm fishing has snakehead in it. I'm pretty sure it has eel in it, though, too. 
and these eels are kind of really interesting because um well they're not like a, a what not like a saltwater eel, eel. They're, they're freshwater eel that will go up on land like a snake but hit the water and they're just pow, gone um i see them in a couple different places they're like oh we don't have eels here i'm like go to marine state park and go up to this one fall up up on slippery rock creek they're all over the place so yeah that's that's another thing so um I think it's called the freshwater eel. I'm not really exactly sure. They, they see a lot of them down in Florida, too. I uh, kind of ought to see them up out of the water. But they, they, they have done that. So, And if you ever see these things, they kind of look like a snake, but they have a very small dorsal ridge that starts right behind the head and goes all the whole way down to the tail. And what I mean small, it's basically, it's not even like a fin. It's more like a little hump. That runs the whole way down. I'm like, was the first time I see one, I was like, what the hell is that? But um, yeah, I'm going to be going up to the mountains. I'm going to take the camera with me. So I'll probably share what I, what I, some of the pictures I take while I'm up there. Um, I'm thinking I'm going to have a Friday live stream because I don't think, um, the folks aren't home. They're actually in New Jersey at the funeral right now. But when they get home, um, we'll probably won't leave till like Saturday, maybe Sunday, and probably be be gone about three or four days. But I'm going to take the camera with me, and Oh, nice, Carol. Um, I'll, I'll probably take some pictures of what I find. Um, the last time I went up there, we did did a lot of driving around, taking pictures. I took a ton of pictures, found a lot of stuff. So it's going it's going to be interesting. So, like, as I said, with the, with the animals out of place, it's, I'm not saying that they're out of place, but I'm saying that they're probably all, a good many of them, save the kangaroos, and Uncle Al, Uncle Al was talking about the uh, camels in Southern California that come from other countries or other continents. The ones that are, that are native here to the United States that are supposedly out of place, it's a good possibility they've always been there. We'll take out the alligators from sewers too. That that's a whole other problem, but it's a good possibility that they've always been there. It's just we just never seen them. Yeah, that's what they said to do here in Pennsylvania. Here, catch and kill. Which I want to see if Marine State Park has snake heads. I don't think they do. Um, they haven't found any snake heads in the Ohio River yet or any of those systems. So I don't think Lake Arthur has them either. But I'm pretty sure Lake Erie's got them. Um, I know some fisheries out eastern Pennsylvania have them. Oh, it doesn't. That doesn't surprise me, Carol. Um, I'm not saying that they're not good eating because I've heard a couple other people eat them since they're, they're, they're they taste awesome. Um, they just said you catch and you kill them, they never said how you kill them and what you do with them after you kill them. Um, um in fact, there's a couple places that, um, like Tibor said, instead of throwing them in the weeds, they kill them. Don't get me wrong, they kill them. They fillet them and they donate the meat that they don't use to um, charity. So that's that. That's one. That's a good way. To, if you're going to kill it and you can't eat it, that's a good way to. It's a win-win all the way around. You remove an invasive species, but you feed people all at the same time. So that's a win-win. <laughs>
That's what I heard. That's what I heard, Tibor. So, um, yeah, and there's um, well, talking about that, is there's a um, because I only have about five minutes left, so I might as well. This back in 2016, I heard of this one. Um, I've been I've been listening to it, the Mike Iaconelli podcast, and they he's a goofball. He's a he's a pro bass fisherman. And I have to admit, he is a goofball, but it, he has a very fun podcast to listen to. But they get into a lot of different controversial subjects when it comes to fishing. One of them was um, Moosehead Lake in Maine. Where on Moosehead Lake, they're trying to eradicate the smallmouth bass. Completely, just outright, kind of like a catch and kill type of thing. So, um, <laughs> what they did was, um, they had a tournament and all the bat, all smallmouth bats had literally caught them and threw them on the bank, and that's it. Uh, because in Moosehead Lake, what they're looking at is tourists, they're not. Their DNCR up there is not looking at the ecosystem. They're looking at tourist dollars. And Moosehead Lake was supposed to be a big lake trout um, fishery, which it still is. They're still catching big lake trout out of there. But they said that the smallmouth bass is eating all the fry, or a majority of the fry. Uh No, they said that those smallmouth bass were stocked, but before the stocking, people were talking about catching smallmouth, like four or five pound smallmouth bass out of that lake before they were ever stocked. So, yeah, they're already there, but now you're, that's a tourist dollar thing. Um, they're kind of doing the same thing in the, in the Delta out in California. Eradicating a lot of the bass and a lot of the game fish out there, basically game fish in general, because they don't want the bass fishermen fighting over it, so they can sit there and maybe that's what I've seen a, a burbo, but they don't want bass in the delta. I hear you, Nature Girl. And this is this is California. The, the, what I'm talking about, and they want to eradicate all the game fish, just so they can have so nobody's fighting over that water. So they have full water rights, and they can ship it. So they can ship that water someplace else, and make a buck off of it. They've done it with a couple other larger lakes in California, in California as well. So. That doesn't surprise me. Yeah, burbos are kind of like the uh, fish lizard of the um, of the amphibian world. It's kind of, kind of like the uh, the fish lizard equivalent to the platypus. Is it a beaver or is it a duck? <laughs> Oh, it's bad enough to have a blowout, but to have a, have a blowout in the middle of the creek, well, that just sucks. But I'm about done, <laughs> Tennessee, but um, I thank you all for coming. Um, I do thank you all for coming. Um, I'm hoping to be on Friday. I should have, we should have plans finalized for Friday about my vacation, so I can let you guys know what's going on there. But uh, you'll have a good night, and I'll see you guys either Friday or sometime next week. Love y'all.